Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for the last session today. Uh, my name is Eric Mitchell. I'm the university librarian here at UC San Diego, so welcome to San Diego. I have the honor today of kicking off this presentation of leading 2021 fellows. I'm here as one of the PIs on this project, uh, which is led by Dr. Jane Greenberg at Drexel University, uh, Kenny Arlish at Montana, Montana State University, uh, myself, Rachel Frick at OCLC, and Jake Williams at Drexel University. Leading is an IMLS-funded early to mid-career professional development program focused on developing data science skills and LAS doctoral students and librarians. Our overarching goal is to build a community of expertise that informs and helps drive experimentation and innovation in the information science and uh, research and practice fields. We're so grateful for the support of IMLS for this effort or for, so for their support of this effort and exciting to be moving into our second year of fellows. This project builds on LEADS, another IMLS-funded effort led by Dr. Jane Greenberg, which piloted this project uh, with doctoral students back in 2018 and 19. And I'll just comment, I was a member of the advisory board and remember well uh, the presentations from fellows and I'm so excited to be able to share the stage with our fellows today. A key feature of our project design is the coordinated collaboration between iSchools, uh, library and information science schools, libraries, and national library organizations like OCLC. For example, our leading project is grounded in the data science expertise of our faculty at Drexel University who develop a boot camp and support our leading fellows throughout their six-month uh, curriculum. Our partner libraries bring pressing data and information science issues as well as a network of dedicated mentors to support. And a bit later in this session, you'll hear about the incredible work of OCLC leading a data challenge uh, that was a pivotal part of this leading effort. Following the boot camp, which starts this entire experience for our fellows, the fellows join a project site to engage in a real world data science project. Uh, we began our project with 15 sites in 2021, and I'm excited to share that we have four new sites joining us in 2022. And I'll just comment, this all works, of course, because of the hard work of our fellows, uh, our, the incredible faculty we get to work with, an amazing advisory board, uh, of which, of course, Cliff is a member. Thank you, Cliff. Um, our various task forces, especially our diversity, equity, and inclusion task force, which supports us in making sure we recruit uh, a great cohort of students. Similar to other community of expertise projects, leading is structured around a node concept. Uh, our goal in organizing into nodes is to create opportunities for fellows and mentors to work together as a team and learn from each other. Our node concept also seeks to broaden and deepen the connections our felt for our fellows and mentors during this intensive and hopefully transformative six month period. And I'll just say in our first year, we learned a lot about what it means to, to launch and lead a community of expertise. And I just wanted to give a shout out to my own fellow who's not here on the stage today, uh, Crystal Goldman, and uh, as well as Sam Grabus, who is our project coordinator for all the amazing work they did. So we just wanted to show you where the fellows for 2021 are and their nodes, and I will think on my next slide you'll actually get to see their faces. You should recognize a few folks uh, here today. If you want to learn more about our fellows, uh, all of them have profiles on our website and certainly currently encourage you to learn more. So in the December CNI meeting, we had the opportunity to share the work of six fellows through a lightning, uh, lightning round style session, and we're excited to be able to highlight the work of another five fellows with you today. <coughs> So following the next five lightning talks by our fellows, uh, Rachel Frick will give us an update on the OCLC data challenge I mentioned, and I expect we'll have a few uh, minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, part of our work in leading focuses on helping fellows tell the story of their research impact through something we call a quad slide. You can think of it as a visual elevator pitch. And so with that introduction, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our fellows. So Amanda. Thank you, Eric. If you give me just a second, I'm going to make the notes part bigger so I don't have to scroll so much. Okay, perfect. Everybody can hear me okay? Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Whitmeyer. I am the head librarian for Stanford's Marine Biology Branch Library, and I am on a mission to make historical biodiversity data uh, discoverable, accessible, and usable. 
I wonder how many of you might have used, ever used iNaturalist or the Merlin Bird ID app. Any other bird nerds out there? Perfect. Um, those of you who have used these apps to observe and identify an animal or a plant out in nature have captured a very specific kind of observational data called a species occurrence. And uh, this kind of data is foundational for studies in ecology and biodiversity. If you're a researcher who's trying to detect something like changes in biodiversity resulting from climate change, for example, you need to have this kind of data over a long period of time. I work at a marine station that's been in the same spot for over 100 years, and I manage several physical collections with observational data locked away in the pages. If I can find a way to pull observational data out from historical documents, it would be a huge benefit to the researchers at the marine station and beyond. So for my leading fellowship with the Academy of Natural Sciences, I was really interested in exploring how much progress we could make toward developing a computational workflow to extract species occurrence records from the corpus of the proceedings of the Natural Academy of Sciences of Philadelphia. A species occurrence, the kind of data you capture with iNaturalist, is an observation of an organism being at a specific place at a specific time. And this kind of data has a home in GBIF, the Global Information Biodiversity Facility, which currently has over two billion occurrence records. But less than 1% of those are from before the year 2000, and less than one-tenth of 1% of those are before the year 1950. An important characteristic about what we're trying to do with species occurrence records is that it's not like a sentiment analysis where you can be really vague about the interpretations, and it's not just as simple as finding the species names in the text. We need to find um, a species name in the context of a sentence or paragraph or list that unambiguously shows that something was present at a given location at a specific time. Unsupervised AI would make way too many mistakes in this assessment. So what we need the AI to do is to cut through all of the hundreds of pages of irrelevant text and show us a reasonably good candidate bit that might have a species occurrence. I need a tool that helps me filter through text efficiently and show me small bits that I can quickly evaluate as being a species occurrence or not. And that's actually a really difficult problem. So finding species occurrence records in the text requires that you can find taxonomic names associated with a place and a date. And exploring our ability to find those three things was our first step. There's a fantastic tool for finding taxonomic names um, in, the te in texts called Global Names Finder. It can find matches for misspelled or partial taxonomic names, which is really helpful if you're working from OCR results, which we are. I was able to create a list of every single taxonomic name that GN Finder found in the proceedings corpus, which is important for our next step, which was using the natural language processing tool SPACY to help us find locations and dates in addition to the taxonomic names. Um, through a process called named entity recognition. To help us understand how Spacey performs NER in the context of the text, I created a simple online streamlit app to visualize the results. And there's a bit.ly link on the slide if you'd like to test it out. I also shared all of my R Markdown scripts via blog posts, which chronicled my journey on the fellowship. And everything that I'm talking about today is on GitHub. But don't look, because it's a mess. <laughs> So after spending some time getting acquainted with the corpus, testing out GN Finder, Python, and Spacey, Steve and I took a step back and really uh, thought about how we could wade through the corpus and winnow it down to a manageable size for the NLP process. Significant portions of the proceedings are dedicated to meeting minutes, donations to the library, descriptions of fossils or geology, and other topics that aren't relevant to our pursuits in biodiversity. Steve had previously done some work parsing the corpus into sections, and he continued that work a step further by using WordNet to determine which sections are probably about plants or animals. Um, within those sections, I tested a couple of non-machine learning approaches to further reduce the corpus. For example, just looking for articles that had the word collected in the title, a list of fishes collected at Port Antonio, Jamaica, 1899. But there were only 20 of those, unfortunately. I also tried text mining the corpus and only keeping sentences that included a taxonomic name, but there were 52,660 of those, so that criterion wasn't specific enough. We decided to pick one of the sections of the corpus and do a bit of a close read on how the NLP performed, really trying to get a grip on how Spacey's linguistic model sees uh, the entities and the relationships between them. We started looking at compound words and engrams. 
what it thinks are verbs and dates and places. And there were a lot of challenges, lots of places where the OCR wasn't good, where the text isn't structured in sentences. Uh, and that's where we ran out of time for the fellowship. We're still planning to continue the work and we're currently navigating how this might intersect with the next Academy of Natural Sciences leading fellow. I'm extremely grateful to have had this experience. Um, as a mid-career librarian who manages a branch library, this fellowship gave me the opportunity to dedicate my time to learning some of the theory and the practices in data science that are directly relevant to my job. And I'm already using what I've learned in a couple of collections as data projects uh, that I have going on. So thank you for your time and I'll pass it on to Chris. Good evening. I'm Chris Wiley. I am an engineering and physical sciences research data services librarian. I'm also a second year uh, information science doctoral uh, student. And as of March 16th, I'm also the interim head of research data services, Granger Engineering Library, University Library, affiliated at UIUC. My research interests are exploring how researchers practices, behaviors, patterns align with theoretical frameworks. A lot of the existing research work that I've done and focused mostly in uh, data sharing, data policies, research data management, I use qualitative interviews and focus groups. So I thought it would be great to combine this method as a complement to citation analysis and data visualization. In essence, visualizing the collection using both qualitative and quantitative methods. Librarians at MSU provided a list of faculty members, uh, faculty members, and the Qualtrics was used for the survey. There were about 92 faculty uh, members. We sent uh, targeted emails to these particular faculty members. 18 responded. The focus of the survey, it was nine questions. The focus of the survey was to assess the perception of finding information that they need for their research, their teaching and learning, as well as the helpfulness of the library and learn the researchers and faculty's perspectives on any possible additional services. Overall, faculty rated their skills at finding information using the library resources as highly effective, as well as the library is highly effective. Their concern, the biggest area, if you will, of uh, displeasure or discontent, if that's even a word, is uh, journal loss. With the assistance of my boss, William uh, Bill Michaud, who presented at this conference here earlier this year, Scopus is used to visualize researchers, faculty, um, impact, it includes publications, citations, and updated NSF and or NIH grants. This other part of the slide is a breakdown of the types of cited references. It's 1,987 cited references of 66 faculty members. What I learned is that Montana State provides access electronically to 86% of the cited references. Some of the lessons that I learned in this experience was one, it was a new experience to use both the citation analysis and a survey. If there was more time, I'd hope for more responses, yet I realize and know that there's never a way to gauge the number of responses that one could receive for a survey no matter when you give it. Things I like to keep working on are one, exploring the most frequently cited journals for uh, trends and patterns, Alt altimetrics, the faculty that discuss the journal access in the additional portion of, of the survey, I'd really like to delve down into why they feel that way and determine if there's any correlation between the initial 66 faculty and the faculty that responded to the survey. And lastly, because I really love research, if I had more time, I'd also look at data sharing and data policies because I'm really interested in that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Chen Yue Zhao, a doctoral student in School of Information Science at University of Illinois at Champagne. Champaign. Um, it, it's great to be here to have my first conference presentation in person. I'm so excited. Uh, as a leading fellow, uh, oh, thank you. 
Uh, as a leading fellow, I've been working on a project, the scholarly elite character characterizing and event distributions in access to institutional repository uh, content. Uh, my mentors are Kenny Arlish at Montana State University Library and Johnson Wheeler at University of New Mexico Library. Uh, for those unfamiliar with RAMP, the repository analytics and, metric, uh, and metrics portal is a web service that aggregates use and performance use data of institutional repository. In other words, uh, the RAMP data is about the access and usage of items in, institution, in institutional repository, uh, like whether the item uh, appeared in search engine results and, uh, and, re and received any clicks. Um, previous studies have shown that a small number of items receive the most click, that is only 1% of items are accessed. So what I was really interested in is what affect the click rates or access of items in institutional repository. Previous studies have shown that some metadata of research articles can affect their usage, including uh, citations or downloads. So my questions for this project is, does metadata affect the click rates of uh, institutional repository's content and how they affect? The objective of this study is to understand the relationships between some metadata field and the click rates of IR content. Um, understanding this can help institutional repository to improve their search engine optimization, like increase visibility on search, their visibility on search engines and attract more uh, clicks. Uh, my mentor provide me uh, with uh, all RAM data from 35 institutional repositories during uh, January 2019 and uh, May 2019. Uh, I only include thesis and dissertations item in my project because there is a primary and highly accessed item in institutional repository. All titles, abstract, keywords, and subject were extracted from related metadata field, and I used text mining and uh, natural language processing for data collection and processing, and I, can, I also conduct some statistic analysis, analytics. Um, so, uh, so some of my findings are consistent, consistent with previous studies on, on research articles. I found um, some, the metadata to some extent can affect the click rates of IR content. First, sh uh, the shorter sh uh, and clear and tightly constructed titles are more likely to be discovered and clicked. Second, uh, titles having a containing uh, a, a column and have or have uh, more non words uh, and some positive and negative words um, often associated with higher clicks. Uh, however, having a uh, geographic information or uh, other uh, specific contact information in titles uh, can affect the click rates positively and negatively depending on the contact. I also found that a shorter abstract uh, more keywords and subject can um, attract more uh, attention. Um, all these uh, all these findings are very preliminary, and this studies also have some uh, limitations, like limited data sample. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, in conclusions, uh, I feel so honored to uh, work on this project and work with uh, Kenny Johnson and Carrie, who is another leading fellow at the same project. Uh, they always uh, they always give me a lot of feedback and support, uh, and regularly check my progress to see if they can help if they can help. Uh, personally, from the latent program, I have learned a lot of uh, data science techniques and skills that I haven't learned before. Um, I feel much more confidence in solving problems involving data analytics uh, uh, in my future studies. Uh, more importantly, I have re I realized that data science is so important in my field and uh, because it can help us uh, make the right decisions and provide better services. Uh, thank you so much.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Etiana Ureri. I'm the metadata librarian for the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley. As a 2021 leading fellow, my co-fellow and I, uh, Hiva Kadavar, worked with the Library of UC San Diego on its farm worker co movement collection. Hiva and I were tasked with exploring ways in which the collection could be better accessed and organized, including methods, automated or manual, or a bit of both, that could extract important data from the collection that could be transformed or repurposed. Initially, we both set out to explore the on and offline elements of the collection to better understand what was in the collection and how those elements were presented in the collection. Very early on in our exploration, we realized that the goal was taking that extracted data and finding ways to connect that data with other elements of the collection. Uh, which included images, uh, audio, and video. Because we didn't have a lot of time to work with the collection and solve the problems that the mentors had, had identified, I wanted to work on things that would make it easier for the UCSD staff or other future fellows to continue exploring this collection, as well, there, as, well as other collections. My focus and what I enjoyed most about this experience was having the space to try different tools that could be useful for digital collections and provide examples of their use to others. I relied primarily on Python tools and packages to create much of the output during this fellowship. I first created a Jupyter notebook detailing the use of two popular PDF mining packages in Python. Much of the documents available in the collection were in PDF form and I felt it useful to provide an introductory demo guide on the why and how of PDF mining. After completing the notebook, I then moved on to creating code to scrape the metadata for the images in the collection galleries, uh, which was a, a bit of a hassle, but I made it through. <laughs> uh, and I've included uh, a bit of the code uh, here on this slide. Go back. Um, uh, concurrently, I took a look at the oral history section of the collection and thought it could be better organized. I created a spreadsheet, uh, that's the second uh, screenshot uh, on the lower right, um, basically giving a better detail of the uh, oral history audio. The last project that I worked on had been informed by some of the things I saw uh, while working on other projects and some of the potential projects suggested by the mentors. I created a Stringlet site, an open source tool that creates web apps in Python that, convert, that could convert MP3 audio files into WAV files, which work better with Python. Uh, it could also transcribe those and other audio files to text using IBM Watson's speech-to-text function which I found in my limited run through uh, of speech to text Python packages to be cost effective and fairly easy to use in lieu of manual transcription, um, either done by staff or during community events. The site can also take text input, in the case of the collection, the text mined from the PDFs and identify named entities uh, using Spacey, and if available, the Wikidata QIDs for those entities, which is a pipe that uh, was created by Open Tapioca. Um, the site is still a work in progress that I hope to maintain and improve over time, but my hope, as with the other things that I've done and identified uh, over the course of this fellowship, is that the US, UCSD library staff and possibly other individuals and in institutions will find some use for these tools in tackling similar projects. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christopher Rausch. I'm here to talk about a project uh, with the California Digital Library and Drexel's Metadata Research Center. Uh, we've called it YAMS. Um, the acronym stands for Yet Another Metadata Zoo, but it really is more than that. It's a dictionary of terms with both fixed and evolving uh, to be meant to be selectively referenced by future standards. Term entries are complete with versioning and persistent identifiers, as well as provenance information. Uh, the motto is YAMS, Better, Faster, Cheaper Vocabulary Standardization. With YAMS, authenticated users can contribute terms, vote, and track, 
and also add commentary. As a little bit of background, metadata is essential to managing research data. There are often multiple domain-oriented metadata standards addressing the same or similar data sets. The YAMS Metadata Dictionary Project was created to help address this problem. By providing an online tool for metadata managers to elicit the feedback of domain experts in order to vet metadata quality, YAMS is intended to improve metadata curation management and overall usefulness in the context of specific disciplines. One of the main goals of the project was to move beyond the repository phase and to begin to introduce YAMS to academic communities and invite them to participate, because the purpose of YAMS is, in part, to tackle the difficulty in consensus building around metadata in general and domain-relevant vocabulary specifically. <clears throat> the architects of YAMS had a great deal of experience regarding this topic, having worked on the original specifications for URLs, web archiving, Dublin Core, Bagot, and a great many standards since then. YAMS began as part of a National Science Foundation effort to support metadata preservation and interoperability. As an ongoing project, YAMS has developed a significant code base over the generations of contributors. A main focus of my participation was the review of this code base in the, context, in the context of current best practices and to make contributions to the public repository as easily as possible. The first part of the assignment was made possible with the help and participation of leading advisors and mentors. Next was the mandate to begin a broader outreach to academic communities that are, in principle, the beneficiaries of YAMS. Busy professionals don't always have time to contribute to collective metadata refinements through complex processes, but they will probably use tools that help them with their own work. Of course, first the code had to be up and running and available for review. We also wanted to take a look at the sustainability of YAMS as both an open source application and as a functioning tool for users to upload and refine terms relevant to their domains. <clears throat> In order to accomplish these goals, we developed a plan for analyzing the existing code base and documentation in order to understand the inner workings of the prototype. Even, the code, even though the code was well documented, and as I'm sure is true of any project, it took time to do this, <clears throat> I was able to consult with previous fellows in order to get a general sense of how things worked and spent a good deal of time just walking through the code. The previous prototype was also hosted as a free app on Heroku, uh, on Heroku, and this imposed some limitations on the amount of data it could accommodate, as well as the, its efficiency as an application. We made the determination to move the code base to a more robust environment. Uh, initially, we used a grant from the NSF Exceed program to prototype on a Linux Nginx platform. Exceed was a valuable tool for computing resources, um, and they were up to the task because the environment was capable of creating many instances of virtual machines where different configurations were possible. <clears throat> uh, YAM's functioning was well documented. There were several existing publications describing how the prototype should work from both the social and technical perspective, and we made a plan to modernize the code base and leverage more of the functionality GitHub provided for collaboration. One significant success was the update of the code base to reflect current best practices using Flask. Flask is a web framework with an extensive community, and modernization helped to bring YAMS in line with current practices that could be referenced online and in technical guides. This also made the application receptive to Flask plugin-like components to let us add functionality quickly and lay the foundation for continuous integration. We were able to present our proposed enhancements at the MTSR, and the subsequent publication will hopefully serve as a roadmap to future fellows. Finally, there's a draft community engagement plan in place that will be available to this year's fellows should they find it useful. An example serves to illustrate how YAMS works. The Global Cryosphere Glossary represents a compilation from 27 sources in a centralized location. When the terms are imported into the working YAMS prototype, we see that there are variations on the term ablation. The original intent of the GCW was to merge terms from disparate sources into an authoritative vocabulary. It had existed in its current state for a number of years, though. The subsequent import into the metadata dictionary allows for ranking and feedback on terms through a social technical interface that has the potential to facilitate this process <coughs> and analogous processes across disciplines. So uh, in conclusion, maintaining continuity over time when project participants change can be difficult. <laughs> Leading provided a way to ensure the long-term continuity of a promising project across funding cycles and invites insights and contributions from the community it serves. Will you join me in giving these people another round of applause? <laughs>
Thank you. I am looking for my slide. There we go. I'm Rachel Frick. I'm with OCLC, and I'm one of the executive directors in the research department. And I'm going to briefly talk about the leading data challenge. Although I might have been one of the people that initially had this idea, I handed off the execution of this to my former colleague, Andrew Pace. So what we did with the leading challenge is OCLC as a leading education hub, we hosted a virtual data challenge. And it was to take place in Dublin, Ohio, in person, and was to include both the Leeds Fellows and the Leading Fellows. But with everything else last year, um, we pivoted to a virtual event. The intention for the data challenge was to create an educational opportunity for the fellows to gather, to co collaborate, and exhibit their skills while working with various sets of data. We, when we adjusted the approach to be a virtual event, we actually took a page out of our colleagues at Web Junction. Um, they had developed a course around uh, virtual escape rooms, and we thought we would use some of those approaches in this particular data challenge and how we organized the work. So over the course of two to three afternoons, we actually had enough fellows and auxiliary staff to field three teams. We had three teams of four fellows plus additional folks. And they worked with a particular data set, which is a large data set from OCLC WorldCat focused on children's literature. And we asked them to create a challenge statement, um, analyze the data, and create a visualization, and then present that back for judging. All the participants received a stipend for participating, but they also competed for a cash prize. So a little bit of incentive there. So as you can see, the winning challenge statement was an inquiry around how, I'm trying to read this from far, far away. Basically, how well were, were libraries serving communities based on language, you know, with comparing language information in the collections data, versus community population data, so how where, well are they serving those populations. So I'm happy to say that we got a lot of positive feedback from the data challenge, and this is something we're gonna be replicating this year, and we're gonna take some of the delta um, plus delta feedback to make some improvements, but also we're playing around with the idea of you know, do we still want to do it virtual because we were able to have more participation? Is it a hybrid event, both in person and pers uh, virtual? But also, should we have these fellows compete with some real world um, data scientists in our library? So if you're interested in kind of um, rumbling with the fellows, let me know. And with that, but I'd like to say, um, we were, I was really grateful for the work of my colleague, Andrew Pace, as well as our data science team at OCLC. And with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions for our fellows here. We had a couple questions. Um, is there any questions from uh, the group here today that you would like to ask fellows? I know we only have about five minutes left and we stand between you and the reception, but I wanted to ask you all a couple questions. Um, you all had different and interesting experiences, um, but how did you find the program overall? Did you, uh, through the support of all these different types of challenges. Did you find a common tie between all your projects? Was it good to work together as a cohort through the boot camp, even though your, your fellowships might have had different data challenges? I mean, the, the boot camp was great, um, first of all, because it was just a chance to get to know everyone. And uh, it kind of put us on the same page in terms of the, the data science requirements. So it. I, um, it, it sort of forced you to go through some formal learning, which I think is a great way to start a program like that. I think, I think for me, uh, as far as the boot camp, I think it was a great way to kind of figure out where exactly we may start or uh, what the uh, particular sites uh, would involve as far as data science. Uh, but it was a great refresher to figure mm -hmm. out uh, what it you know, entailed as far as uh, what we needed to learn and how that could be applied. Okay. Anybody else? 
so where do you see your project headed after this, after the fellowship? Is this something you're gonna continue working on? Are there skills that you develop there that you're gonna be able to apply in your next venture? What we're kind of hoping for is continuity towards, uh, you know, to keep this project going so the fellow that comes after um, mm -hmm. can develop a project. And we kind of put together a plan. I don't, it's up to them to implement it, to engage community members and to kind of build the project. And um, the, the Metadata Research Center at Drexel really kind of uh, took ownership of, of that process because, uh, I mean, it's, it's vetting metadata and that's something that they do institutionally and uh, sort of has, has, uh, has decided to become a, a co-sponsor of it, so. It's Great. Yeah. I could take that. Um, I'm definitely planning on continuing to collaborate um, on the proceedings, corpus text analysis, but um, one of the reasons I chose that particular project to apply for is that it is so directly relevant to the work I do at the Marine Station. Um, I have the luxury of focusing on a relatively uh, as a subject librarian, narrow set of uh, stakeholders at the Marine Station, and so um, that's the lens I look through, you know, my experience and my work as a librarian. But my understanding of their research process is that they, they're not going to come to the library to look for scanned things to work with. W what they really want is research data, right? So, so I'm very motivated to take these extremely rich collections I have in my library and get them into a format that they will actually use. Um, so not only am I interested in, in continuing with the proceedings corpus, I really want to take, and I'm taking what I did through the, the fellowship into my collections in the library. And, and in many cases, it's easier collections to work with because the proceedings is just huge and weird. I mean, you know, they talk about who showed up to the meeting that day and what the, it's just all over the place. And I have collections like student research papers and theses and dissertations and um, research data sets. And it, so it's, they're well scoped for me. So I'm already applying um, a lot of the processes that I've used in the fellowship toward, toward my own work. And it's, it's just been so extremely useful. Great. Chris? I was gonna say, uh, yes, I do plan to continue uh, the work on it. I do, I got an opportunity to present uh, with um, my cohort member at Electronic Gun Resources and Libraries, as well as publishing a paper that should be coming out on it uh, through American Society of Engineering Education. It has also uh, piqued my interest in exploring, like really trying to refine the survey, because I'm curious at how a survey uh, given to engineering and scientists uh, on the campus at UIUC will work, as far as to find out how they really see the services that we offer. So those are some areas that I definitely plan to continue looking into. Any other comments from the panelists here? Uh, well, as far as uh, maintaining the Streamlit site, I hope uh, to plan, uh, I plan on maintaining that and updating that pending a few uh, updates from uh, Spacey and, and Streamlit. But um, hopefully it's something that people can fork and add on uh, themselves and, and kind of branch out from there. Great. One more chance to ask the fellow any questions. All right, well, if you wanna know more about LEADS or the LEADING program or more details about the work, as Eric said earlier, you can go to the LEADING website and um, just keep, keep looking to see what's, how this project is going for our second year. And thank you very much. Thank you.